Newcastle-upon-Tyne, once intended as a motorway city. Today, in the same townscape, the city moves by bus and on a system that is new to Britain. A city transport system called Metro. Metro serves the people of Tyne and Weir. It takes them to work, and it takes them home again. It takes them to theatres and sports events, to shops and offices, smoothly, quickly and reliably. Metro is the hub of a unique public transport network serving the whole region with trains and buses integrated in new route patterns to take people where they want to go. The lives of over a million people who live here are all affected by it. I think it's a very good system. We use it quite a lot, uh, go only from, uh, say, from the castle over the gates. It would do that regularly, and we find it very good. I think it's very good, actually. I think it's very convenient, very handy. It gets me from A to B quite quick. We used to use our car. We used to drive into Newcastle and park our car in Newcastle. I particularly like the children's fairs, which mean I can take my children out for a lot less money. It's quick, it's clean, quick. warm. I haven't used the tubes in London a lot in the earlier years, you know. I think it's every credit due to the people that's introduced it. The seeds of the new system were already rooted in the northeast, an area renowned for engineering and steeped in railway history. The homeland of George Stevenson, the very cradle of the railways. The homeland of Sir Charles Parsons, the father of the steam turbine. And Charles Mertz, who developed electrical power systems. Merged the heritage from both railways and electrical engineering, and the combination gave birth to another idea, trains powered by electricity. It was an idea at the turn of the century that led to one of Britain's first electric railways, the 28-mile suburban railway from Newcastle to the coast, built to rival the new age of the electric tram, a pointer to the metro that was to come. Sixty years later, the city was an example of a classic bottleneck, divided by a river and with bus and rail services competing with one another. By then, the electric trams and electric railways had gone. They had been replaced by diesel buses and a fleet of aging diesel trains. On some journeys, especially when changes were involved, up to a third of the time could be spent simply waiting. Buses and trains weren't coordinated. A separate ticket was required for every journey involving a change. It was against this background that a recommendation was made in 1971 for a new and better transport system. Transport between cities in Britain is excellent, with high-speed intercity trains and good motorways. Movement within cities is the problem. Some, like Edinburgh, have few local trains. Their urban transport system is based on buses. But many European cities, such as Munich, Rotterdam and Cologne, were already building metro systems. Trains run every few minutes to link with local buses at interchange stations on the edge of the city area. Could Tyne and Weir do the same? The Loadings that are predicted in the analysis, I see, give us um, peak flows of something like 15 to 1600. The Tyne Weir Plan, a major study into land use and transportation, recommended significant changes to public transport as well as roads in the area. Get off right on top of the station, get into the station and on. Yes, the rapid transit analysis. It suggested a light rapid transit system running hand in hand with buses with over a thousand in the opposite direction and 1,200, 1,600 passengers boarding. Detailed studies to see how other cities had tackled their transport problems followed. Some used conventional train services and a separate bus network. Others had buses only, running on conventional roads. 
The studies looked into the possibility of special busways. But for Tyne and Weir, the choice in the end was a light rail transit system supported by a network of feeder bus services. The basis was already there, 26 miles of railway on both sides of the Tyne. Rebuild it, add eight miles of new route with tunnels under the city centre and a new bridge. And the scheme took shape. The metro network was born. Over 40 stations around the route, about half of them new. A new pattern of bus routes would focus on transport interchanges. Urban transport could then be operated as one efficient network, buses and metro together. In July 1973, the Tyneside Metropolitan Railway Act received royal assent. Construction of the system could begin. It gives me great pleasure and even more satisfaction to attempt to cut the first sod with that machine and to start our work on our metro system. <laughs> began with the north-south tunnels. They would pass through the centre of Newcastle. They were mostly driven through boulder clay. Where the ground conditions were wet and poor, the soft ground was lined with cast iron. Where the conditions were better, concrete lining segments were used. South of the river, sandstone strata beneath Gateshead contained coal measures honeycombed with old mine workings. It was through this difficult geology that the new metro route took shape. The cavities left by the old workings, some dating as far back as the 14th century, had to be infilled before the new tunnels could be driven. The running tunnels took the form of an inverted arch, unlike the tubes being driven north of the river. One of the metro's major engineering feats is the station at Gateshead. It stands on the site of a filled-in 18th century quarry. 80,000 cubic meters of earth and material had to be excavated and removed. Today it is one of the finest stations on the system and the major bus interchange. After two years work, a breakthrough beneath Newcastle. Tunnelers working their way north from the river met their colleagues driving south. The tunnels met with due ceremony in perfect alignment. In parallel with the work underground, a number of major civil engineering projects were in progress in Newcastle, involving some of the city's most famous landmarks. The Angel of Mercy was removed for work to start on the station at Haymarket. Close to shops, the Civic Centre, the University and the Polytechnic. Today, she watches over a very different hay market. Another landmark, the Victorian portico at Central Station, was part dismantled and its foundations strengthened while construction of the new underground station was underway. Later, it was rebuilt to the original design with the original masonry. At the heart of the city centre, Gray's monument was being underpinned with new foundations for Monument Station. Before it could be built, considerable roadworks and the diversion of public utilities, such as telephone and electricity cables, were the priority. Today, it is the largest and busiest of the six stations in the city. At the intersection of the north-south and east-west lines, Monument is the only station on the system built with two levels of twin-track tunnels. While life went on in the city, stations, interchanges and tunnels began to take shape. In 1976, work began on a major structure, a new bridge spanning the deep gorge of the River Tyne, one of the longest single-span rail bridges built in the UK this century. It is a double-track steel truss girder bridge built under severe design constraints. To meet navigational requirements, there are no supporting piers in the river, and the deck height is the same as for the existing Tyne bridges. The new bridge was to be the longest clear span on the river, 
half as much again as the famous Tyne Bridge. Now named the Queen Elizabeth II Bridge, passengers speed over the river at 50 miles an hour. A year later, work started on a second major structure, the East-West Line, where Metro follows a difficult alignment across the Usburn Valley and on through Biker. The community in Biker is close-knit and has kept its own identity even after redevelopment. Ironically, Metro in this area follows a route originally earmarked for the city's east-west motorway, now never to be built. The famous Biker Wall was designed partly as a sound barrier to combat the roar of motorway traffic that never came. A section whose cutting would otherwise have divided the community was built instead by the cut and cover tunnel method so that the area could be built on later. The viaduct itself a slender structure, was designed to blend with existing bridges. It was the first bridge of its type to be built in the United Kingdom. Match cast joints were glued with epoxy resin for faster construction. Immediate stressing could take place with the growing cantilever structure retaining its balance without the need for temporary support work. On completion, the viaduct's outstanding design received the Concrete Society's award. Across the system, the route was taking shape. The structures and stations were growing. Some existing railway stations were given facelifts to bring them up to standard, while others were rebuilt completely as new metro halts. In addition to seven new underground stations, many extra surface stations were built. The metro stop at Bankfoot is typical, light, attractive and easy to maintain. Another, Ilford Road, fits neatly into an established residential area. Interchange stations are larger than surface stations and they're designed for buses too. For a high frequency service, station facilities are attractive but functional, designed for ease of maintenance and to combat vandalism. Features at the large stations and interchanges include vitreous stove enamel panels for platform and corridor walls, and the use of modular ceiling and lighting panels over concourses and platforms. All the stations on Metro are unmanned. Their operation and equipment is linked to a central computer, and the main stations and interchanges are equipped with closed circuit TV monitored from Metro system control room. Meanwhile, all around the new system, work was in progress on the track. Stretches of old track were upgraded or replaced. And track work laid on the new alignments. In the tunnels, long welded rails were laid on a concrete base, or ballast, depending on the site geology and the tunnel structure. On the Biker Viaduct and the Queen Elizabeth II Bridge, Special joints were installed to take account of expansion and contraction of the structures themselves. Metro was planned to operate on its own exclusive lines. In the northwest of Newcastle, a lightly used freight line was converted to Metro operation to serve an expanding residential area. On this line, a few goods trains share Metro tracks. In other areas where traffic was busier, additional track was laid to segregate slow heavy freight trains from Metro. There are other sections where British Rail and Metro tracks run side by side. For passengers, there is easy interchange between Main Line and Metro services at Hewarth and Central Station. In South Tyneside, Metro follows the course of an old coal railway, which still runs alongside. The new alignment, through Chichester, takes Metro into a densely populated area and includes a new bus interchange situated at a natural focus of the local transport network. Early in the programme, a new type of rail vehicle was being built. The Metro car was born. The first prototypes were tested on a specially built track, evaluating their performance, capacity, speed, safety and the role of the trainman. 
The test centre became a shop window for British Metro equipment, a focus for thousands of visitors, both local and worldwide. Testing of the car design led to placing a contract for 88 production series Metro cars. The Metro car incorporates the best in proven British and continental urban railway practice. It's part of a family of systems ranging from street tramways to heavy urban railways. Much lighter than a conventional train, each articulated metro car weighs only 39 tons empty and has a capacity of about 250 passengers. Metro trains normally comprise two articulated cars and all are single manned. Large windows and hopper vents provide good visibility and ventilation. On the roof of each car is a pantograph which collects electricity from overhead. A light train and a track. To function together they need power. Overhead wires were installed to carry energy above the tracks at 1,500 volts. Here wiring trains run out the contact wires. For open route sections, cantilevers support a simple sagged catenary system. In stations, span wires sighted across the two tracks keep the supporting masts well clear of the platform. In the tunnel sections, height is limited, and here twin contact wires are supported under fixed tension. The speed of metro cars 80 kilometers an hour maximum permits the use of simpler support systems than necessary on a conventional high-speed railway. As a result, the overhead equipment is less obtrusive to the eye. The metro system integrates with the region's existing supply grid and pattern of power distribution. A bulk supply point at South Gosforth feeds a specially built metro substation adjacent to it. In turn, the new substation feeds a continuous specific energy supply to the whole of the central area of the system. Local feeds supply the outlying area. By the summer of 1980, the first substation was commissioned and sections of overhead line energized. Test runs were made to prove the system design under a variety of conditions. With the substations unmanned, Monitoring and control of the power supply system to trains and stations is carried out at the system control center. Here, all control functions for Metro are combined in a single building. A station controller has closed circuit TV surveillance of all underground stations and interchanges and is equipped with a radio link to inspectors. He can also make announcements to every station by a public address system. Will arrive in two minutes. A computer is linked to barriers, escalators, and other items of station equipment. When an incident occurs, for instance, a ticket machine runs short of change, or an escalator stops in an emergency, the computer instantly displays the nature and location of the fault. The station controller can then take the necessary action to restore normality. The signalling system is also monitored from the control centre. Control the 105 over. When you get down to the, the system controller supervises the state of traffic around the metro. But most of the signal control is done by a special computer with the aid of the train driver. Before the trainman starts a journey, he dials his route using thumb wheels in his cab. Computer controlled route setting equipment then takes over. Commands to the signalling system are sent by 79 cable detector loops laid between the rails at strategic locations throughout the 55 kilometres of track. They transmit the train's identity and location to the VTAG computer at the control centre. This computer acts as signalman for the system. As the computer interrogates the track, it operates destination indicators on station platforms. Points and if it's safe to proceed, signals. A signal panel shows the exact location of each train and the movement of points and signals as the computer changes them. 
The system controller can intervene and take over operation if necessary. By 1980, over 50 metro cars had been delivered and trial runs were in progress. Lengthy negotiations on the manning of metro, integration with buses and on pay and conditions were followed by the introduction of a series of specialist training courses for staff, including trainmen. What do you know about the metro? One by now, Talks to schools have been an important feature of a major safety campaign. Volts. So that is very dangerous indeed, and if you touch that, it will kill you. Six years construction work culminated in 1980 with the opening of the first metro line from Haymarket. A few days after the ceremony, the first metro car entered public service to inaugurate the Haymarket to Tynemouth line. Metro was in business. Passengers, curious to try the new system, began to understand for the first time the meaning of integration. Most interchanges feature car parks, travel information centers, and kiosks. They are designed so that buses and metro operate together as closely as possible. The coast service will be coming through on the 7th. Routes and frequencies have been carefully planned to link together. Right, now how long uh, do we need to allow for passengers to get from the bus to the metro? To make interchange easy for passengers, a fully integrated fares and ticketing system has been devised, the first in the United Kingdom. And C56. Through tickets, called transfers, are valid on buses and metro. Fares are calculated on a zonal basis. Transfers can be bought from a vending machine at the metro station or on a local feeder bus. There are also travel cards, season tickets for both metro and buses. Getting around the system is something the able-bodied person can take for granted. But metro is the first public transport system in the United Kingdom to be fully accessible to the disabled and semi-ambulant. There are lifts and escalators at many stations. The lifts are fitted with controls at wheelchair height for invalids. Other award-winning features include special wide entry and exit barriers, narrow gaps between the platform and the metro car, low step heights, and wide entrance doors make boarding and alighting easy. Gradually, line by line, metro opened for passengers. First, Haymarket to the coast, next to Bankfoot, and then over the River Tyne to Hewarth. The opening of this link between Newcastle and Gateshead was an occasion for special celebration, a royal occasion. It marked the start of the service south of the river, a landmark in the region's long history of road and rail communications. The new metro system has many notable features. One is the relatively short time taken between the original recommendation and the carrying of the first passengers. Another is the concept of a network in which buses, metro and parking facilities combine to make it easier for people to use public transport. I wish the county and its transport system well and I have great pleasure in declaring the Tyne and Ware metro system open. The 
last phases to complete the system were the opening of the east-west section from Tynemouth to St. James, and the final section between Heweth and South Shields, south of the Tyne, in the centenary year of that town's local transport. It was the final phase of the initial system, a system that had taken 10 years to build. The original concept was completed in full. Today, the result is a highly efficient system, bringing with it advantages to Northeast England and its social, economic and industrial development. Metro was designed with the future in mind. Already, extra stations are to be built. After that, extensions and additions can be made progressively to carry Tyne and Weir's transport system into the next century. Metro was designed for one environment and one conurbation. Increasingly, it's being seen as the solution to similar transport problems in other environments, other cities and other countries. For many, a modern rapid transit system is the way forward, the only way ahead. Thank you.